I'm Phil Barnes, and it is my privilege to chair the UT Ollie Enrichment Committee. Dr. Mark Lawrence, the director of the LBJ Presidential Library, and himself, a widely respected historian, is the host for each of these interviews, focusing this year on presidential decisions for war and peace. From these conversations, we are learning just how complex and often difficult these decisions were, and perhaps we can take away lessons for today and tomorrow. Let me remind you that as a participant in this webinar, you may present questions throughout the program for our Q&A segment by using the chat function to write and submit them. Our Q&A host again today is my UT Ali colleague, Sandy Chris. Elizabeth Varon is a professor of history at the University of Virginia and specializes in the Civil War era in the American South, as well as other cultural history. She's the author of numerous books, most notably including the award-winning Appomattox, Victory, Defeat, and Freedom at the End of the Civil War. Lee's surrender to Grant at Appomattox, as it has been written, evoked a highly gratifying image in the popular mind Many believe it was a moment that transcended politics, a moment of healing and a patriotism untainted by ide ideology. But in reality, that was a myth. The myth of Appomattox, as the underlying reality was quite different at this moment when the Civil War ended. For Grant, and for most of the North, the Union victory was one of right over wrong, a vindication of a free society. For many African-Americans, the surrender marked the dawn of freedom itself. Robert E. Lee, in contrast, believed that the Union victory was one of might over right. The vast and personal rapacious Northern war machine had simply worn down a valorous and unbowed South, forced to surrender, but never defeated. Lee was committed to peace, but also to the restoration of the South's political power within the Union and the perpetuation of white supremacy. Lee's explanation of the war's end built in large part on exaggerated, if not sometimes fabricated information about the war itself, especially the disparity between the size and commitment of the Union Army and the Confederate Army, paved the way for Southern resistance to Reconstruction and framed much of the debate about how we treat and teach history today. Well, this is the important historical context for our conversation with Elizabeth Farr about decisions for peace at the end of the Civil War by both Presidents Abraham Lincoln and Andrew Johnson. So I'm delighted to welcome for today's interview, Elizabeth Barron, the author of Appomattox, Victory, Defeat, and Freedom at the End of the Civil War. And now to Mark Lawrence. Well, thank you very much, Phil, for that wonderful and thoughtful introduction and um, welcome everyone. It's wonderful to have you all back for the second week of our program and welcome in particular to Professor Elizabeth Varon. Liz, it's great to see you and I really, really appreciate your willingness to be here with us today to talk about your specialty, the American Civil War, and especially, as Phil mentioned, the ending of that war and all of the contestation and controversies that ensued in the years thereafter. It, it may be true that all peace agreements are both ends and beginnings. They're the end of the fighting, of course, but also the beginnings of new contestation um, that the that the war has left unresolved. I think we saw last week uh, 
for everyone who attended our session with Professor Laterman, how the end of the First World War, the greatest war the world had ever seen, gave way to lots of controversy and contention that many would argue in turn fed into the tensions that contributed to the outbreak of another world war only a couple of decades afterwards. In any case, Liz, you write of Appomattox in a line that really caught my eye. The surrender was not just an ending, but a beginning, an inherently political moment that set the terms of an unfolding debate about the meaning and implications of the war. And I, let's get us uh, let's get rolling by by um, connecting the history of the Civil War a little bit to our present moment, and then we'll we'll dive back into history. Is, is it fair to say that Americans are still having this debate about the Civil War in the 21st century? Absolutely, Mark. And and broadly speaking, I can observe as many Civil War historians have done, trying to account with the for the perennial fascination Americans have in the Civil War. It fascinates us because of the ways that the core issues at the heart of the war, defining citizenship, uh, race relations, freedom, the scope of federal and state power, these remain contested. And, and we can certainly uh, come back around at the end of our conversation about 1865 and its aftermath to, to modern day lessons learned and, and reverberations. But specifically what I had in mind when I observed that Appomattox was a beginning, not just an ending, was some of the themes that Phil Barnes previewed uh, in his in his opening uh, comments that it's a political moment, not the gentleman's agreement of myth and memory, right? Uh, with Lee and Grant shaking hands and 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 uh, burying the hatchet uh, and and uh, you know healing uh, and and reunion, uh, you know, seated at that moment. I, I make the case in this book that at Appomattox, as these two men meet. Claims are staked, political claims are staked that really do shape the post-war period. And as, as, as Phil began to, to explain, uh, those claims that are staked are competing interpretations of what has just happened and what its meaning and implications should be for American political life in particular. So Grant and Lincoln, Grant very much uh, um, uh, with his surrender terms, we'll talk about some of the details as instantiating Lincoln's will and intentions with regards to the war's end. Grant and Lincoln see the Union victory as a victory of right over wrong, as, as Phil said. And specifically what, what I meant um, in, in sort of uh, that formulation was for Grant and Lincoln, the, the Union victory is a vindication of free labor society and, and its productivity and its, and its dynamism. Uh, we see that in the in the in the sort of size and strength of the Union Army. They certainly saw it that way. It's a claim about vind the vindication of majority rule. They very much believed, and this is a, a thread I'll weave throughout our conversation of central Union assumption and a Northern assumption was that secession was the work of a small band of conspirators, elite slaveholders, secessionists who had kind of cast a spell over the white Southern masses uh, and led them. Uh, down, uh, uh, you know, a path of 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 of, uh, of, of defeat. Um, the claim that they staked in arguing that the Union victory was a vindication of majority rule and of a free labor system, meaning a, a system in which people are are, are uh, remunerated for their labor as opposed to a slave labor system. The claim they were staking was that that victory had given them the right to remake the South and, and a, a mandate uh, in which defeated Confederates must yield to the new order. So Lee, Jefferson Davis, Confederates see this Union victory in very different terms from the very start as a victory, not of, of might over right, uh, or rather not of right over wrong, but a, a, a one of a might over right, as, as Phil began to explain. And they're staking claims of their own. Uh, the claim uh, that's at the heart of the lost cause ideology that military defeat on the part of the Confederates wasn't a moral defeat. It wasn't a defeat of their principles, a defeat of their armies, but not of their principles, that the cause was in a sense not lost. Uh, so somewhat counterintuitively, the essence of the lost cause ideology is that the cause wasn't, wasn't lost, that it could still be won in the realm of politics. And at the heart of that, uh, that idea of the Union victory as a victory of might over right, right over wrong, was a Confederate argument, which Lee begins to stake even in his farewell message to his troops, in which he refers to the Union victory, uh, relying on the overwhelming numbers and resources, as he puts it, of the Union army. Um, it's an argument that the Union victory was 
as a victory of might, at its heart illegitimate, and that the Union did not win uh, the right to remake uh, the South. So uh, in a sense, uh, we're still um, debating all of this because these were claims and debates uh, that are seated by these claims about uh, whether the Union victory had conferred a mandate on the Union, whether the Confederate cause was legitimate and had retained any legitimacy, whether the Union and Confederacy could share the moral high ground. And this becomes you know, a subject of de debate very, very uh, very soon and very intensely, Frederick Douglass will observe famously in 1878, 13 years after this uh, Appomattox agreement at the end of the war, the Union victory, Douglass, uh, the great black abolitionists will, will observe there was a right side in the late war and a wrong side and no sentiment ought to cause us to forget it. And Douglass feels it's necessary to make that observation because he feels that already by 1878, Americans are starting to forget it, that, that the, uh, I, the, the image of the war is a, as, a, as, a, uh, as a vindication of the union cause of a free labor system of majority rule is, is faded and, and, and uh, contested and, and under fire. Uh, and so, it, you know, in, in that sense, um, uh, the ending of the wars is is very political, as appealing as the image of a of a kind of um, meeting of the minds between Lee and Grant might be. It always struck me as completely implausible. These men were warriors, you know, to the core, both of them, uh, and each deeply committed to his respective cause, and and uh, that commitment didn't evaporate at the moment they signed those those uh, those peace terms. So fantastic. So lots here to, to, um, to get into in, in more detail. Um, take us back, though, to you know, 150 years. And let's talk for a minute about the actual circumstances that led to the end of the Civil War. Um, March and April 1965. Why, why was it that these weeks brought about Lee's surrender? Tell us a little bit about the military situation. And sure. Why this is why this brought an end to the war. Yeah, it's a fascinating uh, uh, sort of final act here for the war, and 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 it's so easy to sort of imagine if we think about earlier so-called turning points, Gettysburg, Vicksburg, and so on, that people were marking off the days until Appomattox at that point. But there was nothing inevitable about about any of this. It was all so contingent and quite dramatic. So. Um, the, the month of April 1865 brings an, uh, an effective end of the war, and I'll talk about armies that were still in the field and what the, what the surrender meant for the Confederate project of independence in a moment, but it, it brings this moment of reckoning because the Confederacy is spent largely at this, at this point. Grant's strategy of attrition in the Eastern theater of war, of just hammering at Lee's army, knowing that Grant could replace lost men and Lee could not, uh, had worked. And one thing I would emphasize in keeping with this idea of the Union victory as a vindication is that it's not just the Union's superior numbers and resources, again, to quote Lee, that result in that um, demise of the Confederate Army. It's also the Union superior leadership. Grant and Lincoln and Sheridan and Sherman have this intense command harmony. They settle on a strategy for winning the war. They're all committed to it, each playing his part. Sherman's success in the Atlanta campaign is March to the Sea. These things help to affect Lincoln's reelection. Sheridan, Phil Sheridan in the Virginia's Valley. I'm sorry, I have a light here that goes off automatically if I don't move from time to time. So I've got to, occasionally you'll see me uh, wave or move as a consequence. Um, the um, Sheridan in the Valley, uh, uh, destroying uh, Southern infrastructure to starve Lee's army. Uh, and then finally, Lee's army pouring out of the trenches of Richmond and Petersburg as Grant's long siege finally uh, uh, breaks Confederate lines and heading west in a dramatic retreat across the central Virginia countryside to Appomattox, a sleepy little hamlet in the middle of, of Virginia. Um, and, and again, the Union Army's skill and determination key in this last campaign, this Appomattox campaign, they chase Lee down and they block his escape route. He had hoped to link up with Joe Johnston in North Carolina and to, to, to fight on. Um, but the Union Army catches him, Sheridan and Grant, crucially and symbolically very uh, uh, important uh, detail here is that among those Union soldiers who, who wage this last Appomattox campaign, who catch Lee, who block his uh, retreat route, are African-American soldiers in the U.S. Army, USCT units, so-called. And for them, 
the symbolic importance of being in that group that had brought Lee to heal was uh, naturally a uh, very, very, um, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a very sort of important and portentous uh, contribution that they had uh, that they had made. So um, the the uh, Army of Northern Virginia, Lee's army, is is brought to heel by Grant's army because of the superior numbers and resources and the and the determination and skill of of uh, of Union forces. If those closing stages of the war had unfolded in somewhat different ways, could you imagine that the war could have continued for a significantly longer period of time? And I guess this is a, a, a way of getting at just how important, how important this sheer manpower disparities and industrial capability disparities mattered to, to the outcome. They mattered, they mattered a great deal. Um, and certainly Confederates debated in those final days, Lee debated and discussed uh, with his, uh, uh, his own high command, whether they should fight on a guerrilla warfare, melt into the countryside and keep fighting in that way. Lee rejected that in part because, as a number of people have said, he felt it was dishonorable, but also in part because he knew the Confederates had tried that and it hadn't worked. There was a lot of guerrilla warfare, particularly in the in the uh, uh, sort of uh, borderlands, places like Missouri, uh, and and the Union had developed effective counterinsurgency me measures. So that that you know that would have that 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 was not a, a path to, uh, to to victory and to Confederate independence. And and Lee was. Um, was uh, was 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 well aware of that. Um, it, all of this, of course, raises the question. Gets takes us back to the origin of the war. I often have students ask me. You know, the North uh, uh, has a much uh, bigger society, a much bigger army. Couldn't Confederates crunch the numbers? What do they think they were doing in provoking the war in the first place? And of course, they had believed they could win and that they would win. And there were many perceived uh, and imagined advantages that they had and were counting on. They were hoping for foreign recognition. They had in mind the example of the American Revolution and the small band of patriots to find the British Empire and, and all the rest. But um, particularly re relevant for our conversation here, Confederates had hoped, and Lee very, very much was in this particular camp, had hoped that uh, they might divide the North that Confederate victories, that the that, that the costliness of the war, that the scope and duration of the war might wear away the Norse will to fight, to make the required sacrifices to bring victory, and that that uh, declining morale in the North, particularly if they're Confederate victories in the North, hence these invasions of Maryland and Pennsylvania, Antietam and Gettysburg, um, they had hoped that perhaps Northern voters would turn against Lincoln, turn against the Republican Party, throw Lincoln out of office. Maybe the opposition party, the Northern Democrats, who, who had commanded 40 percent of the Northern electorate. You know, Lincoln, we, 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 we think of him as a as perhaps our greatest president and a, and, and a you know, legend and icon and so on. But he was very embattled in his own day, even in the North, with critics on on his left and and right. And those critics on the right, Copperhead Democrats, really um uh, some of them seemed quite willing to to negotiate a peace with the Confederacy, perhaps even a peace that accepted Confederate independence. So Confederates all along were hoping against hope that um, that the North would be divided. And so when I focus on the importance of leadership and accounting for this final victory, I have in mind the guy who's you know bust is behind you there in the, in the background, of course Lincoln, who's who whose leadership was crucial to keeping the North together and preventing these fault lines from dividing the North in just such a way that, that the Confederates hoped it might. They might. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so tell us about the agreement that Generals Lee and Grant reached at Appomattox. What did it specify? So, you know, famously, Grant's terms are exceedingly lenient. This is in keeping with, with Lincoln's wishes and with some precedents uh, during the war. Confederate soldiers are essentially sent home, uh, no punishment, no recrimination, uh, on the promise that they will obey the laws of the United States, including emancipation measures and so on, uh, and that they won't take up arms against the, U the United States again, a pretty low bar. Uh, and that leniency, it's very important to note, again, to understand what a kind of politically fraught moment this was. Even the leniency had political motivations and could be spun and interpreted politically. Grant's motivations, Lincoln's motivation was not to exonerate the Confederates to suggest that there was a you know, moral or political worth to their cause. 
the purpose of the leniency was to affect their absolution and their repentance, you know, to change hearts and minds, as we might say in the context of modern warfare. And they expected them and hoped that the magnanimity would be rewarded by uh, compliance, you know, and by a, a, an accession and yielding to the changes uh, that that uh, that had come and and and, and were coming. Um, so uh, uh, the the magnanimity itself, the premise for it, was a, an idea that was at the heart of the Union war effort. I alluded to this briefly once before, but but this is just underscores again how we can't really talk about the ends of wars without understanding the beginnings of the war aims and the evolution of war aims. Um, Lincoln and Northerners had conceptualized the war as a war of deliverance to deliver the Southern masses from the slaveholding elite. Uh, and they believed that, um, that perhaps this, uh, uh, these magnanimous terms could be the sort of crowning uh, uh, you know, uh, policy here for this war of deliverance, change hearts and minds, prepare the way for, uh, for um, the peace. And I want to ask you to take us further into Lincoln's thinking in just a minute. But before we get there, um, help me understand something that I find puzzling about the Civil War, and for that matter, many for that matter, many other wars. How is it that this landmark surrenders, defeat of Confederate forces in one specific location? How did it lead to the general surrender of Confederate armies across the South? Because after all, not every Confederate soldier yeah. was. Yeah, great, great question. So. Um, the war, the, uh, the, the surrender is, is, we describe it as kind of the effective end of the Confederates bid for independence, but it doesn't end armed struggle. There are other armies in the field, Joe Johnston's army in North Carolina, Edmund Kirby Smith in the West, as you all in Texas know so well, it's not until June 19th, 1865, that Union forces are able to liberate Galveston, hence Juneteenth, the roots of that, that holiday and that, that Freedom Day. Um, so uh, uh, it, it, Appomattox, April 9, 1865, doesn't end the fighting, but it is the, a domino that falls that leads to the fall of the other Confederate armies, the surrender of the other Confederate armies. And the reason is that Lee's army had by this point become essentially the focal point of Confederate nationalism. In the eyes of Confederates, the hopes for uh, for Confederate independence rested on Lee's army, his ability to defy the odds, to, 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 to um, you know, prevail over overwhelming numbers, to hold out, uh, and so on. And so um, given, given the, the symbolic importance of Lee as a symbol of unity, um, the fall of his army was, was uh, again, the first of a series of falling uh, dominoes. Okay, so a, a few hundred miles away from these dramatic events sat President Lincoln in, in Washington or, or thereabouts. Tell us a little bit more about how his thinking changed over the course of the war about what peace should look like. So Lincoln had uh, always been in favor of what we might call a soft peace. So again, working on the assumption that secession was the work of a small band of conspirators who had, who had duped and seduced uh, 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 the Southern masses uh, into, uh, into uh, accepting secession, um, Lincoln was keen on restoring states to the Union as quickly as possible. And as a consequence, even while the war is being waged, we have an experiment in wartime reconstruction in Union-occupied areas of the South. Lincoln puts in place a, a, uh, a process for bringing those occupied areas back into the fold. The big experiment is Louisiana, where Union occupation early in the War of New Orleans uh, uh, and the presence of some white Southern Unionism leads Lincoln to believe that this uh, experiment can take root. We can see Lincoln's desire for what we might call a soft peace. Obviously, the, the most famous rhetorical expression of this is his statement in his second inaugural about malice towards non-charity towards all. That was the spirit in which the peace would be, would be forged. We can see the policy aspects of this spelled out in uh, his December 1863 proclamation of amnesty. Uh, it's it's a, a move of Lincoln's that's that's sort of little known and little understood, but but a very very important. December eighteen sixty three, he essentially um, offers a return to the fold, return to citizenship, return to their previously held rights, not the right to hold slaves as emancipation is already uh, union policy, 
but all other uh, rights, right to voting and property holding and so on, to Confederates who take an oath of, of present and future loyalty. Uh, and uh, he hopes that once 10% uh, of the antebellum voting population, the 1860 electorate in any given Southern state has taken that oath, that that vanguard, that 10% can begin a process of, of, uh, of having that state re-enter the union. And again, Louisiana was the major test case for this. So the Appomattox terms, in a sense, the leniency, the go home, obey the law, and, and there'll be no reprisals, no, no, no punishment, no um, um, economic price or political price uh, uh, to, uh, to pay. Um, that is, is uh, you know, not surprising. He had showed his hand, uh, not only in his malice towards none and charity towards all uh, dictum, but also in his proclamation of amnesty. And Lincoln hoped, and, and again, Part of what I'm I'm suggesting here is that there's this um, idealism seems almost naive in retrospect. Lincoln had hoped that Confederates would would take him up on the offer, that they would flock to the banner. The Union troops were given copies of this 1863 Amnesty Proclamation to leave in Southern houses to distribute uh, in the Southern Army uh, and and so on to try to try to get the word out. Uh, he was very disappointed when he found that, it, you know, fell on, on on deaf ears. Confederates were committed to a, a, a mostly in a kind of last ditch mentality to fighting to the bitter end, uh, and and very few took him up on his offer. But but the the persistence of the belief that hearts and minds could be changed is quite intense, quite surprising. I, I, I wrote a book called Armies of Deliverance about this notion of the Union War as a war of deliverance and, and, and the resilience of that notion. Now, um, that uh, all of that said, Lincoln's views had changed over the course of the war. And, and, and the most important change, of course, is that he'd come to believe that some hard war tactics were necessary to to uh, secure the victory that would then result in this soft peace. And the hard war tactics were a targeting of Southern infrastructure, a targeting of Southern morale, a targeting of Southern uh, property, a confiscation policy that um, was an opening wedge towards emancipation and then the Emancipation Proclamation itself, which Lincoln initially justified to the Northern public as a war measure under his powers as commander in chief to hurt the enemy by undermining the enemy's economy and an economy based on, on slave labor. So he had come to, be to believe emancipation was a necessary tool, but he'd also come to believe at the very end of, of the war, and then really the first time he expresses this belief is in the days before he's assassinated, he had come to believe that um, uh, some African Americans should perhaps vote, be part of the body politic, the part of that vanguard that's going to bring those errant Southern states back into the Union. Uh, and he makes famously in his last uh, speech, um, uh, uh, after he's heard the news from Appomattox, uh, April 11th, he makes uh, uh, a, a, a his first um, uh, sort of gesture at the idea that perhaps black suffrage is something that should be considered, especially, he says, uh, uh, suffrage voting for Union veterans, African Americans who fought in the Union Army altogether. There were 200,000 of them, and they'd been utterly crucial. Um, so he had come to, uh, to see those Southern Blacks, Unionists, um, as, as um, you know, a crucial part of union victory and as and as uh, a part of the Southern body politic. So a, a, a great deal of your really fabulous book, Appomattox, which I happen to have right here, um, is is taken up with exploring how different elements of the American population understood Appomattox and thought about the meaning of the war in the immediate aftermath. I, I know you could speak, Liz, all day about any of these strands of thinking, but in a nutshell, I mean, they span, they range from the Copperheads, the, Demo the Northern Democrats, to moderate Northerners, died in the wool Confederates, African Americans, right? There's a whole range. I wonder if you could speak about that range and tease out some of the complexities of uh, the ways in which e even in the immediate aftermath of the war, this debate was already bubbling to the surface. Yeah, absolutely. This goes back to our, our simple observation that the surrender is a politically charged moment. And again, how could it not be? Uh, uh, the, 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 all of this um, 
uh, peacemaking got filtered through party politics and and was highly charged uh, uh, in in that in that sense. So Lincoln's party is the Republican Party. The Republican Party believes that. Um, that the the union victory hasn't only vindicated the free labor system and majority rule, but its handling of the war effort. That it is the entity that ought to control the government uh, and and control the uh, uh, control the uh, the, the, the the peace process. Um, and so we have Republicans, both moderate and radical Republicans, eager to uh, to um, uh, to you know maintain political uh, control to not let it just fall back into the hands of those whom they have vanquished, or of those, the Northern Democrats, Copperheads, who have been a really uh, uh, unruly at times, uh, and, and as Republicans see it, disloyal sort of fifth column. Copperhead Democrats, essentially, the, as I said, 40% of Northern voters were Democrats. They fell into two categories. War Democrats were those who really supported the Union war effort, fought and died for it. Um, uh, were committed to it. They just often disagreed with Lincoln about means to the end of, of union victory. But there were some so-called Copperhead Democrats, it was a derogatory nickname for them, um, who were really Confederate sympathizers and, and, and who were so critical of Lincoln, of emancipation, of the, of the union draft, of various union policies, um, that they seemed willing to sacrifice uh, uh, um, uh, sort of union victory and to, and to negotiate a peace with Confederates that conceded uh, Confederate independence. Not surprisingly, uh, these Copperheads um, uh, essentially buy into the might overwrite Confederate interpretation of, of union victory because they don't want the political opposition, the Republicans, to feel like they have a they have a mandate. They want to undercut. Uh, they want to undercut that that mandate. So we have a, a you know a, a, a political rivalry, partisan political rivalry as a key setting here. African Americans, again, two hundred thousand African American men in the Union Army. They fight in in all the sort of theaters, important theaters at the end, uh, are there at Appomattox itself, and they believe that the surrender, first of all, is a Freedom Day, one of the biggest sort of surprise discoveries I made when I wrote this book about Appomattox was that April 9, 1865, that day we surrendered a grant, loomed really large in African-American uh, communities across the country as a freedom day. Um, you know, we associate emancipation with the January 1st, 1863 Emancipation Proclamation, with Link which Lincoln promulgated, and that announced his intentions to use the Union Army as an army of liberation. But in places it didn't control, it couldn't penetrate, freedom was theoretical, de facto freedom followed the Union Army. It's only where the Union Army was present to enforce freedom uh, that, that uh, and, and, you know, hence the meaning of Juneteenth and the arrival of the Union Army in, in, in Galveston. Um, so Appomattox was a freedom day that um, symbolized, particularly for African-Americans here in central Virginia, where, where Grant's, the presence of Grant's army brings a de facto freedom, it symbolized the realization of the promise of Lincoln's Emancipation uh, Proclamation. And they believed that, um, that their contributions to the Union war effort, which were, which were massive, uh, uh, there's a mass exodus from farms and plantations as, as enslaved men and women flee seeking uh, refuge with the Union army during the war. They then contribute to Union victory as, as spies and scouts and nurses and soldiers and in countless ways destabilizing slavery throughout the South. And they believed, understandably, that that had entitled them to full citizenship. So again, different interpretations of what what the what the, the uh, surrender meant. And, and, and just as these different lines of interpretation are, you know, bubbling to the surface and intensifying um, in the aftermath of the war, comes the assassination of Abraham Lincoln just five days after Appomattox. Um, talk a little bit, if you will, about how that assassination figures into this bigger story, both in terms of how this act by a Confederate sympathizer against the federal government's leader um, affected kind of the, the, the balance of different lines of debate about the war, but also about, talk also about the man who replaces Abraham Lincoln, Andrew Johnson, and how, 
having him in the White House changes the whole equation of what reconstruction would look like? A, a great question. And again, it's important to note that John Wilkes Booth's assassination of Abraham Lincoln is a political murder uh, motivated by uh, Booth's uh, uh, Confederate sympathies and by his um, loathing of Lincoln's policies, particularly emancipation. Booth is in the audience when Lincoln uh, says that he is contemplating uh, black suffrage, and and uh, and uh, uh, Booth is is um, is uh, 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 deeply opposed to any challenges to white supremacy, and his murder of Lincoln is is uh, is an expression of Booth's own uh, commitment to, to to white supremacy. So. Um, Lincoln's, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's just such a, such a tragic moment. He, he had sort of seen the promised land of Union victory, but only for five days before his life is, is, uh, is taken. And naturally, Northerners are shocked by the assassination. They are, uh, you know, sent into a kind of spiral paroxysms of, of grief. And there are calls right after the assassination uh, you know, for a harsher policy, you know, maybe leniency wasn't such a good idea. Maybe these people don't deserve magnanimity. Maybe it's not going to work. Um, and 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 uh, you know, uh, those who who believe that the leniency was misguided, those voices will persist. They'll 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 um, uh, you know be a part of debates about Reconstruction and what shape it should take. But what surprised me in looking at this aftermath is that. There was a kind of call and response. The, those who said oh, perhaps magnanimity was misguided were answered by those who said the best way to honor Lincoln and his memory is to remain committed to his vision of malice towards non-charity towards all, committed to his vision of, of, of magnanimity. So Johnson, Lincoln's vice president, uh, very consistently at polls, uh, uh, at the top of polls, uh, you know, modern polls about who's our worst president. And I said, you know, sad to say he very much earned, earns that designation. Um, he uh, is a, was a fascinating man, a wartime unionist, an old Jacksonian Democrat, Southerner from Tennessee, Southern Senator who had um, uh, uh, not gone along with secession, but defied it partly because he had longstanding resentments of the uh, sort of planter elite as a, a man from the yeoman class. Um, and he had been put on the ticket by Lincoln and the Republicans in part in deference to this idea that there was some latent Southern unionism that might brought to be, be brought to the fore, some latent loyalty that maybe could be, excuse me again, this uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe brought to the fore, um, you know, if there's a Southern Unionist Johnson uh, on the ticket. Uh, there was also hope that war Democrats would be attracted uh, to him. Lincoln runs for re-election in 1864, not as a Republican, but as a representative of the National Union Party. Uh, and Johnson is supposed to sort of symbolize the big tent uh, that that party represents of patriots committed to victory. So after the war, Johnson very quickly shows his true colors. He's an erratic personality, all kinds of problems uh, 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 just at the level of, of sort of personality and, and, and sort of political skills. But the core problem is that, as it turns out, he has a very narrow definition of Black freedom, uh, a, a, a narrow meaning of freedom only to work for wages, but not, not for anything else, not to have a voice in American politics, not to have social or political equality, not to be uh, considered part of the body politic or, or you know, brethren uh, in, in, uh, in, in the national uh, fold. Um, and this um, means that he uh, opposes any any radical or thoroughgoing remaking of Southern uh, society. Uh, and he very quickly begins to curry favor with the ex-Confederate planter class. Um, he's committed to a policy of leniency and forgiveness, but he goes much farther than was reasonable or than Lincoln would have done. He promulgates his own amnesty proclamation. It offers amnesty to those who take an oath of loyalty to the union. And it stipulates that the higher up leaders of the Confederacy, the political leaders, the generals and officers, the very wealthy would have to come to him, president, for personal pardons. And he then grants those pardons by the thousands. He pardons former generals. He pardons uh, uh, you know, the uh, Confederate uh, uh, government elite. Uh, and this permits 
uh, the uh, phase of what we call presidential reconstruction, for, uh, presidential meaning under Johnson, Johnsonian reconstruction, in which from 1865 to 1867, uh, again, no black suffrage uh, as, as, a, as a counterweight, uh, former Confederates essentially um, retake the reins of these Southern governments and institute uh, a series of, of, of uh, racist punitive laws, so-called black codes that put in place the system as close as possible to slavery without being slavery uh, you know, by, by name. These larger than life figures, Lincoln himself, of course, Andrew Johnson, Thaddeus Stevens, I mean, the, the cast of characters is really remarkable, I think can perhaps lead us to think that all of this was really contingent. It really just depended on these kind of great, powerful, charismatic, fa endlessly fascinating individuals. But the focus on these individuals can maybe distract us from the possibility that really didn't matter ultimately who was calling the shots. The, um, the challenges of reconstruction were inevitable in some ways. The, the, the sheer impossibility of a lasting solid peace coming out of the Civil War was impossible given the fact that four bloody years of war had just been fought. I wonder what, what your thoughts are about that counterfactual scenario. It, were mistakes made that if they if they had only been if decisions had only been made in different ways, you know, we could have been talking about a different aftermath of the Civil War. Yeah, that's a great question. People often ask me, you know, what if Lincoln had lived? Would he have done a better job than Andrew Johnson? And I think he he certainly would have would have done a better job, and he would have tried to find ways to to incentivize uh, and and motivate. Uh, compliance to explain to the American people why why change was was necessary. He was he was very very uh, very very good at that. Uh, and uh, uh, Johnson again became a, a sort of a, a, a barrier um, to change. But um, it, Lincoln would have found the same thing that Johnson and Grant and other stakeholders and political leaders found, and that is that the recalcitrance of former former Confederates was so great. Um, their uh, unwillingness uh, to change. Uh, the way I would sometimes put it in in uh, in talks on on the Appomattox book was to say that the message of Grant and Lincoln with those lenient terms was: we don't want to punish you, South defeated Southerners. We want you to change. And the message back from those defeated Confederates was that the demand for change was a form of punishment, and that that's how they were going to see it. Now, we can see that recalcitrance right from the very start. Part of the kind of uh, lost cause myth of Reconstruction is that congressional Reconstruction, which is the answer to Johnson's uh, um, sort of disastrous uh, restoration of power to former Confederates, the Confederate Reconstruction, when con the, the con uh, rather um, uh, re uh, congressional Reconstruction, when the Republican Congress in 1867 does uh, decide to really try to remake the South, particularly by enfranchising uh, African American men and changing the the shape of the of the uh, of the electorate? Um, that that was uh, uh, punitive, and 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 that groups like the Klan came along to to sort of check the excesses of the corruption of radical Reconstruction. This is I've just described an old, essentially lost cause myth. The, the reality of the situation is that. Those groups like the Klan came on the scene very early. The Klan is formed in 1866 during Johnsonian Reconstruction before African Americans can vote. It's formed to preempt that change. So, in other words, the Confederate resistance to change was such that there were uh, they immediately moved to preempt uh, change. Uh, and in that sense, um, you know, structurally, Reconstruction was was uh, was uh, you know up against some really terrible. Obstacles. You mentioned Thaddeus Stevens. We, I, I, I passed briefly over radical Republicans. These are Republicans in Congress who are most sympathetic to abolitionism and to a, a, an agenda that, that really includes a change agenda that really includes equality and full civil rights for African Americans. Some of these radical Republicans said, you know, to really have a peace that sticks, you're going to need to have some economic change, perhaps even land redistribution. Some radical Republicans said, hey, I've got an idea. How about we take all those giant Southern cotton plantations and we divide them up and give them to the men who 
you know, sacrificed and died and lost limbs and so on to win the Union War and save the country. That didn't get anywhere because that was considered too radical. And it was considered too radical among most Northerners, not only uh, among uh, among white white Southerners. And this is just a way of, of sort of segueing to the fact that it's not just Southern recalcitrance that dooms Reconstruction. It's also uh, uh, the the uh, shallowness of the white North's commitment to 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 uh, to, 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 to civil rights. And there is a Northern retreat from Reconstruction um, that, uh, that is the reaction to all of the havoc wreaked by these white supremacist organizations, the terrorism, there's no other word that's really appropriate, the terrorism wreaked by groups like the Klan in the South. And, and, and I'll just you know, say it should be obvious that that, that terrorism um, uh, was uh, uh, politically motivated and, 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 and uh, with a profoundly nefarious and cynical end. That is to say, the message of, of uh, groups like the Klan was you can't have change because change will bring chaos and violence. They then perpetrated chaos and violence and said, the only way to have peace and order is by going back to the old hierarchies, the old, the old uh, inequalities, the old um, white Southern democratic dominance of, uh, of the South. Liz, so many more um, questions I want to ask you, but um, I want to pause here just for a minute to invite our audience to please uh, put questions into the Q&A that you can find conveniently at the bottom of your Zoom screen, I hope. I see a few questions building up there already. Good, is, excellent, excellent. Um, but let me ask you just a couple more while sure, um, sure. to bring us to a conclusion, uh, while others are putting some questions, I hope, um, into, into the list here. Um, Going back to where we started and kind of the yeah. way that all of this reverberates across many decades and certainly um, down to our own times, um, let, let me ask you about a, an episode that is, of course, pretty fresh, I think, in all of our memories, um, January 6, 2021, when we saw individuals flying the Confederate flag during the takeover of the Capitol. Were they, in a sense, making a case about the meaning of the Civil War? So, you know, making a case, I'm not sure that uh, uh, that uh, those who were flying the Confederate flag really know much of anything about the Civil War. So I don't know if I if I would put it quite that way. But even without without knowing uh, details, they were certainly uh, uh, shaped by the history we've just described. And it's quite clear that insurgents in January 6th who held up the Confederate flag uh, thought that flag was meant to symbolize racial grievance, racial animus, and to act as an emblem of resistance to social change, which it was in the 19th century and continued to be in the era of the civil rights movement and in the, the, the era in which uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, and others uh, were, were taking civil rights uh, positions. So, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's no question that this history reverberates. I'll give you uh, just uh, sort of one one example, the insurgents, the rioters there on January 6th, 95% of them were white. They were protesting the results of an election, Biden's election, declaring it illegitimate. 90% of African-Americans voted for uh, Biden. Trump told that crowd to foment the riot that, and I'm quoting him here, quote, you're, you, the rioters are the real people. You're the ones that built that nation, so, uh, uh, that built this nation. So Trump's message was, you uh, are the people who count. This was his message to the rioters. Now, for me as a historian, uh, you know, I can hear echoes in this of secessionist arguments. And it doesn't matter whether the rioters knew it or not. They probably didn't. But um, secessionists argued that Lincoln's election was illegitimate because uh, they, they argue this is a little bit of a kind of footnote to some broader secession arguments is something that's little known. But among the arguments secessionists made was the fact that some northern blacks had voted rendered the entire election of Lincoln illegitimate because, according to the Dred Scott decision, African-Americans were not citizens, therefore their votes were illegitimate. The message of secessionists was that Lincoln was an illegitimate leader of the country because uh, he didn't represent the people who count. Uh, and and so I mean you know there's 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 a there's a playbook uh, and and uh, used by those who oppose social change and we see that playbook 
pressed into service again and again and again. We're we're shaped by history, whether we know its details or not. But as I heard these arguments, you know, you're the real people saying uh, uh, to a crowd that wants to deny the legitimacy of an election. To me, uh, that was an echo of arguments secessionists made back in 1861. And Liz, finally, from me. Um... Thinking again about the end of the Civil War as an exercise in peacemaking, I wonder if there are lessons that flow from Appomattox and everything that followed in the decade or so thereafter that are useful potentially for thinking about peacemaking and civil wars, a very complicated political situations in our own day. I mean, certainly, I think that, you know, one of the big lessons from Appomattox and and um, uh, you know this. This won't surprise you uh, as a fellow historian. Is that you have to be prepared after winning a military conflict to fight a political battle about the meaning of the war and, and, and a kind of propaganda uh, a battle. Uh, the amount of misinformation that circulated during Reconstruction was staggering, and that misinformation. Uh, you know, promulgated by defenders of slavery, by the lost cause uh, sort of uh, 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 kind of agents who romanticized uh, the Confederacy and, and who argued, uh, again, that the cause could still be won by political means. Um, their defense of slavery, again, the romanticization of the Confederacy, their denigrating of Union victory, all of these things um, had, had a cost, uh, and they folded a critique of Reconstruction as corrupt into this defense of, the, of, of, the, of slavery and of the Confederacy. Uh, and and uh, Northerners, alas, proved you know, very susceptible to this propaganda. It went hand in hand with the terrorism campaign uh, that, that I described. Just to uh, give a, a few sort of illustrations, one way to think about this, I think that's, that's uh, illuminating is, is as follows. Uh, one thing that struck me as I wrote my last few books was that Lincoln justified emancipation and the changes that it brought, not only as a military necessity, a way to hurt, to hurt the enemy by striking at his resources, but he also justified it on more idealistic grounds as a policy that would benefit all Americans, including and especially white Southerners and non-slaveholding white Southerners. Most white Southerners on the end of the Civil War didn't own slaves. Again, the Republican Party of Lincoln imagined somehow that there was a lot of latent unionism among them. They were wrong about that. Uh, but um, nonetheless, they felt that the system of slavery, a system dominated by a small, they were, they were not wrong about this. Sla the, the Southern states were dominated politically in the pre-war period by a small number of, of slaveholding politicians. Those slaveholding politicians had put in place a, a system that among other things suppressed free speech uh, no Republican or abolitionist could get a hearing in the South because they'd be run out of town on, on a rail or, or, or worse. So Republicans imagined that once that secessionist elite was defeated and the South was opened up for the flow of new ideas, um, that um, they could, uh, again, change hearts and minds and that everyone would benefit from that. One of the problems that Andrew Johnson represents as Lincoln's successor is that he rejected this idea that black freedom would bring broad benefits to American society, to all Americans, including whites. And he reverted to a zero sum game way of thinking about race relations, that any gains for blacks would come at the expense of whites. This was a kind of toxic theory that we can trace back to the you know, colonial period. Um, so there's, in a sense, uh, one way Lincoln could have made a difference is in pushing this idealistic case you know, that he pushes in effect in the Gettysburg Address in, in the second inaugural and so on, rather than reverting to the zero sum game thinking, which was very, very damaging in the end. But a second more um, sort of a maybe smaller scale observation is, you know, I often have people ask me, um, why wasn't there a kind of Marshall Plan for the South after the Civil War? You know, that might have won hearts and minds. And, and the answer is there was a Marshall Plan for the South. It was called the Freedmen's Bureau. The Freedmen's Bureau was this federal agency that distributed rations and, and rebuilt communities in the South. And it didn't only benefit uh, African-Americans, it also benefited whites who in many places in the South received more rations from the Freedmen's Bureau than, than, than African-Americans did. But the Freedmen's Bureau was, was kind of, um, undermined and swept to the side by this propaganda war, which cast its agents as, 
as agents of corruption and conquest and and so on. I, I mean, I'll, I'll end by saying I, I didn't I didn't mention this particular uh, detail as we talked about the surrender terms themselves, but it's hugely important and why you know it, it, it's always worth taking a new close look even at familiar topics. So when Confederates were uh, surrendered at Appomattox paroled, so, uh, so to speak, again, I'm sorry about this. Um, uh, when they were uh, paroled at Appomattox, um, they were given a, a paper they had to sign in which they, uh, again, promised to obey the laws of the United States and um, uh, never to take up arms against the Union again. And the parole form said that they would not be disturbed if they made and kept that pledge. So as far as Grant and the union was, were concerned, this was their, their, their rights and their freedom and their participation, their reunion was contingent on that good behavior. And the parole was a promise of good behavior. In Confederate eyes, that form they signed was a promise that they would not be disturbed. And they began to argue the moment the ink is dry on the surrender terms that any change to the social order would disturb them and therefore be a, 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 you know, a, a break of the Appomattox terms. This is just a long-winded way of saying, to say the surrender is a beginning, not an end, it is, is to say, now we start a political battle about what it means, a propaganda war, and you better be ready to fight that war and to win that war if you want to have a chance for the peace to stick. Well, Professor Elizabeth Varon, thank you so much for all of your eloquence and, and insight. I've really enjoyed this fascinating conversation. Uh, I want to congratulate you and, and simply call attention to your many books. Uh, a couple that I happen to have right here are Appomattox, Victory, Defeat, and Freedom at the End of the Civil War. Thank you. Armies of Deliverance, A New History of the Civil War, both of which go into um, great detail in some of the themes that we've been talking about today. Thank you again, Liz. I've really enjoyed sure, it. My pleasure. I hope we have some questions. I'm happy to answer them. David Heath asks a question that uh, from something that he's <clears throat> read in history that Grant and Sherman told Lincoln that they needed the Emancipation Proclamation Declaration, uh, that it would be helpful, if not necessary, to winning the war. Is this correct? Yeah, so um, it, it is true that military commanders, um, I, 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 Grant and Sherman weren't in that group lobbying for emancipation. There was a group that lobbied for emancipation. Lincoln was hesitant at, at the, as the war started to, to contemplate emancipation because he knew the North was politically divided, that uh, uh, that those Northern Democrats, for example, had, uh, had no interest uh, in, in, uh, in emancipation and were quite hostile uh, to abolitionism. Uh, he also knew that there were slaveholding border states, uh, uh, um, uh, Maryland and Kentucky and Missouri and Delaware, uh, that, had, that had resisted the siren song of secession and stayed in the Union. He wanted to keep them there. He didn't want to move too quickly. He's lobbied by people like Frederick Douglass. Douglass, has a wonder, of course, had a wonderful way with words. I quoted him once before. But one thing he says early in the war is, to fight a war against slaveholders without fighting against slavery is but half-hearted business. We better target slavery if we want to win this war against slaveholders. So Grant and Sherman aren't in that class with with uh, with uh, with um, Douglas and Thaddeus Stevens, but they are in a class of Union commanders who come to see emancipation as as militarily uh, beneficial, and Grant more so than Sherman on this. Uh, uh, Sherman. Um, was less enthusiastic about emancipation and all of its all of its uh, sort of implications uh, and entailments than Grant was. Grant became very, although Grant was not an abolitionist by any stretch of the imagination, not a particularly political guy before the war, but he understands first of all that emancipation is going to undermine Confederate the Confederate economy. Uh, second of all, that it's going to open the door, which Lincoln's proclamation does, to the enlistment of African-American men in the Union Army, and Grant becomes a huge booster of this and sees it as really crucial to Union victory. Um, uh, and he knows that it's going to make the Union Army an army of emancipation and, and infuse the war with a kind of moral... Uh, moral momentum, you know, that 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 was uh, that was key. So yes, and Lincoln is able. He, he finds the example of Grant particularly politically useful because he's able to say to critics, and we see him try to answer Northern Democrats who are like, "But we didn't sign up for an emancipation war. Why should we support this?" He says, "Look, my commanders in the field—they're not politicians. They're not abolitionists. They recognize the necessity 
of, of this. So it's a great question. Let me uh, return to your conversation with Mark on, uh, on uh, Lincoln's views uh, about uh, the post-war period reconstruction and so forth. You make the statement that there was a desire to have a mandate to remake the South, a right to remake the South. I just want to challenge you a little bit. Isn't that a bit strong? I mean, Lincoln, in his speeches and policies on the post-war period, not only seemed to be soft, he seemed to be a little uncertain. He, he talked. That he said he had no exclusive or inflexible plan, that he simply wanted to restore seceded states. And in fact, with a couple of states, he was willing, at least temporarily, to restore old South governments in Virginia and North Carolina. I mean, it seems to me that, um, I just want you to talk a little bit more. Yeah, that's a great question. Whether that, whether that amounts to a mandate to remake the South or something maybe a little softer and different. Yeah, so I mean, remaking the South could mean a huge spectrum of things, which is where your question goes. And Lincoln, absolutely had a much narrower version of what, what changes ought to be put in place than the radical Republicans. And indeed, when he promulgates his, his December 1863 offer of amnesty, the radical Republicans who were very close to abolitionists and really wanted full freedom and full citizenship for freed people, uh, for, for African-Americans, former slaves, um, says the radical Republicans say, this doesn't go nearly far enough. This is far too low a bar. We should only be empowering those who have been unionists all along, not people who say, oh, uh, sorry, uh, no, you know, I'll be good from now on. Uh, we should be building black voting right into uh, the, the, the plan for reconstruction. We should be contemplating things like land redistribution. So Lincoln doesn't go there, absolutely. My point, uh, though, is that in the eyes of former Confederates, Lincoln's, what we can see in retrospect, seems like a pretty low bar, uh, remaking the South in the sense of giving political power to unionists, to people who are loyal to the union, um, uh, uh, both those who had been loyal to the union and those who now profess loyalty to the union. Um, in, in the eyes of many ex-Confederates, that was a, re <laughs> a fundamental remaking of the South, but they were not willing to, uh, to, you know, to, to, to abide. Uh, the hostility, uh, you know, Southern unionism is a fascinating topic. Of course, African-Americans were unionists and their unionism is really the kind of the beating heart of Southern unionism and the core of it. But there were also white Southern unionists. Johnson is an example. They had a variety of motivations, a variety of politics. Some were quite conservative, some were more a progressive using those those terms in, in, in the context of what they meant at the time. Uh, um, uh, the, the divisions among them meant that that they had trouble sort of asserting their their own their own power, but they unionism had been violently repressed by Confederates during the war. And the idea of handing power over to unionists was was a pretty radical idea. And it's, you know, so I completely agree with you. There's a huge gap between Lincoln's moderate Republican agenda and a radical Republican agenda. But but unfortunately for the Re Republicans, in the eyes of ex-Confederates, uh, none of these agendas were acceptable. Right. I want to, uh, Joanne Richards, there are a few other questions that take me in a direction. I hope you're okay with me going. I want to move ahead into, um, if, if, you, if, you, if you're willing to let me do it, to the period of time when Grant was president. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and there are other questions that relate to this. Should the Union Army have stayed in the South longer to reassure freedom for African Americans? Uh, you had uh, you had a uh, you had different kinds of reactions. The Klan did get started immediately, but it seemed that there was sort of a radical uptick uh, a few years later. And the differences began to grow. Uh, what caused all that? And talk about Grant's leadership when he was president of the uh, reconciliation or the reconstruction period. Yeah. So Grant is, you know, fascinating a character, obviously hero of the Union War, and a quite embattled president whose presidency had a pretty uh, negative reputation for a long time. The, some of his underlings were were were. were uh, corrupt and that that tainted his presidency somewhat. But on this subject of civil rights, Grant was quite heroic. He 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 wanted to um, and, and it took him a while to, to sort of to come around to see that things like black suffrage and a, and and congressional reconstruction and and a 
a presence of the Union Army in the South, the prolonged presence were necessary. But he did, through the so-called Enforcement Acts of 1870-71, for example, try to try to break the back of the Klan to infiltrate it, to, to stop it. Didn't succeed entirely, but uh, but um, but did try. This question of an occupation of the post-war South, I, I mentioned that Northerners imagined that secession was the work of a small group of conspirators and that the white Southern masses might be brought around hearts and minds changed. They found and learned uh, that um, Confederates had been, uh, again, uh, uh, you know, very uh, uh, deeply committed to their own cause and not receptive to Lincoln's amnesty proclamation or to or to um, various sort of incentives um, uh, to uh, to change. And um, we can see this uh, this both this hope of, of, of changing hearts and minds and the kind of hard wall of resistance that it that it comes up against the hard realities that it clashes with. If we look at the story of a, of a in interesting man of whom, about whom I'm writing a biography now, it will come out in the fall, I hope folks will look for it. And that's James Longstreet. James Longstreet was a Confederate general, second only to, to Lee in the Confederate high command. Uh, and Longstreet, uh, in a way that was almost singular for such a high up Confederate, accepted Grant's terms in the spirit, the Appomattox terms, in the spirit which Grant offered them. That is to say, you've lost, you had a war, the war was the arbitrator here of these political debates. Now as the losers, you have to yield. Uh, and if you want peace, you have to accept peace on the victor's terms and try to make the best of it. So Longstreet in, in 1867, much to the surprise and amazement of a uh, of just about everybody comes out in support of Congress's reconstruction plan, the centerpiece of which was African-American voting. And he becomes part of a, this coalition, a Republican coalition. It included some white Southerners who came around. It included newly enfranchised African-Americans and it, it included some Northern transplants to the South who tried to govern the South during, um, during reconstruction, during the period of congressional reconstruction, 1867 to 1877. And they did all sorts of incredible things. It really is quite astonishing uh, that um, uh, that uh, uh, we have a sort of attempt here at interracial democracy during this this uh, this ten years. Again, it meets with a, a, a backlash, both violence and propaganda, uh, you know, from uh, from the start. Um, and we see that in the case of Longstreet, um, he is branded a pariah, a Benedict Arnold, a Judas, Lucifer, every you know insult you can think of is hurled at him by ex-Confederates who see him as a traitor to the lost cause, a traitor to white supremacy. Uh, and uh, uh, numerous people have noted this in, in recent years as we've had these discussions about Confederate statuaries and, and, and memorialization, no statutes to Longstreet in the South because he wasn't, although he was a very high up Confederate general, he wasn't useful as a symbol of white supremacy because he 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 decided to support the Republican experiment. Uh, I'll, this will bring me back to Grant. The reasons Longstreet makes this this unconventional choice are manifold. I'll, I'll explain them in the book. There's all kinds of personal and political motivations, but at the core of Longstreet's decision is his friendship with U.S. Grant. They were great buddies back to their uh, West Point days, and Longstreet believes that Grant's magnanimity at Appomattox made Grant the the greatest man of the era and someone who who was deserving of of uh, you know of, of support that's great thanks for those stories look forward to that in the book um so we have a couple of questioners who want to uh, ask you what if questions what if war questions jim Parrish and mike pastorius uh one asks what if lee had been able to link up with johnston's army and the other asks, what if Sherman had not, had failed to take Atlanta? Would those, uh, I know uh, they happened the, the way they happened. Right, right, right. But, but just in terms of just uh, calculating impact on the war, which you know a lot better than we do, talk about the uh, effect of those things turning out the way they did. As yeah. 
Yes. Great question. So the Atlanta question really loomed large, you know, in, in, in all kinds of political calculations, because here we have the election of 1864 pending. Lincoln is up for re-election. Some people said to Lincoln, you know, it's a civil war. Maybe you don't hold an election. He said, if we don't hold an election, they've won because we're fighting for a majority rule and for the system the founders set up to have for a peaceful transfer of power. You vote, you abide by the results of the election. So he's up for re-election. The union war effort is stalled during that summer of 1864, leading up to the election, Grant and Lee duking it out in Virginia uh, in a stalemate, uh, Sherman's uh, Atlanta victory is absolutely crucial. The Confederates are watching all this carefully because there's a school of thought among Confederates, really represented mostly by Alexander Stevens, a Confederate vice president. They're really hoping that if the Confederates can hold out, if Sherman and Sheridan and Grant are kept at bay, if they are perceived as failures, maybe Lincoln won't win and a Democrat will be elected. McClellan is the Democratic candidate who will come to the negotiating table and concede Southern independence. Um, so because Sherman takes Atlanta in the fall of 1864, Lincoln is able to counter the Democratic arguments to say, he's able to say the war is a success. The Democrats were saying the war is a failure. Your leadership of the war is a failure and so on. Lincoln can say the war is a success. Atlanta uh, is is ours, and that and and he rides that military tide uh, to uh, to um, to victory. The counterfactual: What if Sherman had failed to take Atlanta? Maybe Lincoln would have lost the election. Maybe McClellan would have become president. Would McClellan have accepted, you know, come uh, signed a, a peace that accepted Confederate independence? I think the answer to that is no. I think you know, despite. The fact that there was some peace Democrat or Copperhead voices in the Democratic Party that were quite loud, McClellan would uh, have wanted to achieve victory, meaning the defeat of the Confederate independence project and the restoration of the Confederacy to the Union. So I don't think the fall of Atlanta would have changed that. Um, the other question was about what Lee and Johnston. Um, I mean, I think in that in the in the Eastern theater there, the writing was on the wall. They might have been able to hold out somewhat longer. But, um, you know, as people often observe that Sherman's march was targeting men in Lee's trenches in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, Georgia families, South Carolina families, North Carolina families in the in the in the path of that march, writing their, you know, soldier uh, menfolk uh, uh, saying, uh, you know, you got to desert. Then the Confederate Army was was uh, was uh, really plagued by desertion in that in those last few months. Uh, so I, you know, given given the again not only the manpower of the Union, not only the industrial might of the Union, but the command harmony between Grant and Sherman. Grant and Sherman would have figured out a way to finish yeah. uh, finish the Confederates off. Yeah, I've got a lot of good questions left, and I've really got time for just one. So I want to continue this theme of, of, of sort of what ifs, because uh, this relates to our discussion earlier about uh, attitudes in the South. Uh, how could attitudes in the South have been different, or under what circumstances could they have been different? Steve Fennerty is asking, did the tactics of Sherman and Sheridan, this sort of aggressive uh to shorten the war and win the war, did they have long-term effects of alienating the South? Uh, yeah. In ways that had a lasting impact that made it harder to have a better, a better peace. I mean, I would say the answer to that is that, um, and it's, it's important to appreciate this. So the union argues in the early days of the war, our, our, our war aim is to restore the union, to bring you errant brethren uh, back into the fold, to deliver the Southern masses from the Southern elite. Confederates and secessionists, even before there's a Confederacy, secessionists argue that the union is intent on waging a war of conquest and extermination and annihilation. These are the words they use. In essence, uh, for for uh, union victory meant a restoration of the country and 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 an abiding commitment to the idea that northerners and southerners could again be countrymen. The premise of secession was that they could never again be countrymen. So even before the first shot is fired, Confederates are acting as though uh, the Union is waging a war of annihilation, exterminate. In other words, the secessionists primed the pump so that. Um, 
you know, the, the Union Army taking down, you know, uh, fence posts or slaughtering hogs was seen as evidence of a war of extermination. The Confederates were predisposed by ideology and propaganda to believe that the Union was waging a merciless war uh, uh, full of wanton destruction. Now, so in other words, I'm not minimizing the devastation of, of the campaigns of Sherman and Sheridan. And I'm saying that they fit a script that was pre-existing, uh, that existed even before, you know, the, the first battle of Bull Run. You have Confederate commanders saying your enemy is waging a merciless war of, uh, of annihilation. And, and in a sense, they're trying to counter the Union message, which has come back to the fold, uh, errant brethren. Again, propaganda, uh, uh, pr propaganda war. And the other thing I'd say about Sherman and Sheridan is that, uh, and there's been a ton of work on this um, over the years, that it would be wrong to see their campaigns as indiscriminate, wanton brutality. Sherman in particular is targeting, it's as one historian, a guy named Mark Grimsley has put it in a really great book, um, Sherman's destruction was targeted severity. He was targeting Confederate military assets first on the grounds that if you destroy property, you can perhaps save lives and hasten the end of the war. He was targeting the Confederate higher ups and secessionists and planters, uh, 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 and and tr and and advised his men don't go so hard on people who might be unionists or potential unionists on the on the laboring classes and so on. So there's a there's a method to Sherman's uh, uh, destruction that is that is meant to set up again maybe the biggest irony here, perhaps more so than any of the people I've described, Sherman believed a soft peace was necessary, a hard war and a soft peace. The war is your punishment. But then uh, it, it, Sherman's message all along during his march is, you come back to the Union and I will protect you. It's your choice. You have a choice. And 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 so uh, Sherman very much believed in a soft peace. And he, uh, at the uh, um, uh, Bennett's place uh, uh, meets with Johnston and offers Johnston even more lenient terms than Grant had offered. So lenient that 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 Johnston has to say, "Wait a minute, you know, uh, again, uh, it's really up to the civil government, the politicians, to decide the details here." But a hard war and soft peace is a typical sort of mentality for uh, for, the, for the Union. Well, Professor, I could go on and on. I've loved every minute of it. Thank you. But the clock forces me to pass you on to Phil Barnes. Thank you so much, Sandy. Much appreciated. Wow. Well, Elizabeth Varon, what a wonderful afternoon. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Phil. Thank you so very, very much. And of course, Mark and Sandy, you made it special. Many of us in the audience are members of UT Ali and friends of the LBJ Library, or perhaps both. And if not, please check us out. Both of these organizations offer a wide variety of outstanding in-person and virtual programming, much of like you saw today. And thank you all for tuning in. We will be back, same time, same station, next Thursday, January 26th at 4 p.m. for a conversation with Mark Silverstone, also from the University of Virginia, about John F. Kennedy and presidential decisions leading to the escalation of the war in Vietnam. We hope to see you next time. Goodbye for now. <laughs>